Welcome to the part 6 of video series on ethics and professional practice. Earlier we mentioned that FE civil exam contains a couple of legal topics. Professional liability, contracts and contract law. For any practicing professional, the main causes of liability are going to be criminal conduct, violation of contract law and liability in tort. And the focus of this presentation is going to be on liability in tort. Before we proceed any further, there is a disclaimer in order. This presentation is meant for engineers as a quick review on contract law and professional liability and it is never meant as a comprehensive coverage of these two topics. Second, the material is compiled from sources that are believed to be authentic. And the third and the most important thing is the presenter, which is me, I am an engineer and I am not a lawyer. Despite my best efforts, information presented here may not be very accurate. If you must require some legal opinion, consult a qualified attorney and do not take my word for it. We would like to acknowledge and express our sincere gratitude to Mr. Christian Tacit of Tacit Law for allowing us to use some of his material in this video. Let's get started. One of the privileges of being a professional engineer is that you will be able to sign and attest on documents and engineering designs and what by signing what you are doing essentially is that that work complies with all the codes of practice come with that privilege and responsibility is also a liability and it can be personal liability meaning your employer may not be able to burden that liability you have to so before you attest your seal of approval on that document and before it blows up on your face you better be very careful and also know the liability part of your signature on that particular piece of document and this is what we are going to talk about in this video and that liability is called liability in tort or simply tort Tort is a part and parcel of professional practice for doctors, engineers and many other professionals. A tort feeser is a person who commits tort. A tort is essentially a civil wrong other than a breach of contract. Tort law defines what constitutes a legal injury and establishes the circumstances under which one person may be held responsible or legally liable for another person's injury. Tort law makes a professional legally responsible for his or her work based on a provision called the duty and standard of care requirement. Professionals have a duty to exercise the skill, care and diligence that may be reasonably be expected of a person. That is, a professional person in a particular discipline like a doctor and an engineer. This person should have an ordinary competence measured by the professional standard of that time. And that is the duty and standard of care requirement. As I mentioned earlier, I'm just an engineer. I have absolutely no background in law. Understanding and absorbing the nuance in tort law is challenging enough for me. And then, as I sat down to prepare a presentation on tort, I realized that it is even more challenging. The flowchart you see on the screen just came to my rescue. The chart is from a book by Mayer et al on legal aspects of property, estate planning and insurance. Chapter 7 of the book is on tort law. The book is available for free on internet via Creative Commons. If you are a doctor, an engineer or a physical therapist or any practicing professional for that matter, it's what they read. If you are watching this video on YouTube, we might have provided a link in the video description below or you can write down the citation from the screen and do a web search for to download the book. Before we get into the details of this flowchart, let's differentiate between the plaintiff and the defendant. A person filing a civil lawsuit seeking damages for tort is the plaintiff in this case. A person or an entity the plaintiff is suing is called the defendant. Earlier I mentioned that a person committing a tort is called tort feeser, but unless a tort has been determined to have occurred in a court of law, the defendant is just a defendant and not a tort feeser yet. And now, here is how the chart is organized. Please browse the chart from left to right as I am describing. There are four distinct phases in determining if a tort has happened and then making a legal judgment if in fact a tort has occurred. These four phases are identified in the second level from top, fault, type of injury, 
type of damages and excuses to understand this hierarchy better the four phases can be described in the form of questions first has there been a fault if yes what type of fault is it is it strict liability negligence or intentional second if there was a fault did it result in any injury at all if an injury has occurred did it happen to a person or persons or to property if it happened to a person what kind of an injury is it physical or emotional likewise if the injury is to a property what type of injury is it to that property if it has been determined that there has been an injury resulting from the fault or what in legal terms you call it tort in the third phase the type of damages are assessed the damages can be compensatory or punitive and after the damage assessment is done in the fourth phase the court will determine if the defendant has valid excuses let's first look at the categories of tort there are three distinct categories of tort strict liability negligence and intentional tort strict liability tort in strict liability tort a person is legally responsible for the damages and loss caused by his or her acts and also omissions regardless of the culpability in other words in order to prove strict liability tort there is no need to prove fault negligence or intent to do harm let's see what negligence tort is about negligent tort covers full scope of human activities such as product liability slip and fall negligent misrepresentation professional negligence etc duty of care is the first element that must be established to pr- proceed with an action in negligence in order to prove negligence the claimant must be able to show a duty of care imposed by law which the defendant has breached in turn breaching a duty may subject an individual to liability the duty of care may be imposed by operation of law between individuals with no current direct relationship such as familial or contractual or otherwise but eventually they become related in some manner as determined by common law according to a principle called proximity principle what is this proximity principle it involves the notion of nearness or closeness a nexus or relationship it embraces physical proximity in the sense of space and time between two parties or their property it also concerns proximity in relationships such as employer and employee or of a professional man and his client it also includes casual proximity in the sense of the closeness or directness between the particular act or course of conduct and the loss and injury sustained it may also reflect an assumption by one party of a responsibility to take care to avoid or prevent injury loss or damage to another after establishing the duty of care owed by the defendant the plaintiff has to prove a breach of that duty of care by a failure to meet the required standard of care and the plaintiff also has to establish a casual link between the defendant's act or omission and the plaintiff's loss or damages furthermore the plaintiff should also establish that damages were reasonably foreseeable at the time of the breach negligence can involve compensable harm that is purely economic in nature this is often the situation though not exclusively in cases involving negligent misrepresentation which is different from negligence in general so what kind of a defenses are there against negligence claims first if there is no duty of care word no tort and no negligence claim at all the duty of care can only arise in circumstances involving reasonably foreseeable harm and proximity sufficient to establish a duty of care first and where there are no policy reasons that would negate the establishment of the duty of care so no duty of care word no problem second there is no breach of standard of care and if there is no breach there is no negligent claim right third no damages were caused by a breach of the standard of care 
Well, there was a breach, but really there were no damages. Fourth, damages were not reasonably foreseeable. Well, the defendant could not foresee these damages. And the last one is the statute of limitations has expired. In all these cases, there are legitimate defenses against negligent claims. Duty of care exists based on a special relationship, right? What if the professional person makes a representation that is untrue or inaccurate or misleading? Then there is no doubt that the representation is made negligently. The person receiving the representation relies on it in a reasonable manner and it turns out that the reliance is detrimental and because of it damages result. And that's what's known as negligent misrepresentation. Defenses to claims for negligent misrepresentation are similar to the defenses against negligence in general. First, no duty of care is owed. So no duty of care, no problem. Second, plaintiff's reliance is not reasonable. Example, the representation was part of a discussion and not a formal opinion or the professional limited liability through disclaimer clause. Third, professional negligent misrepresentation did not cause any damages. And lastly, the limitation period has expired. In all these cases, there are solid defenses for negligent misrepresentation claim. Intentional torts. Intentional torts against a person include assault, battery, false imprisonment, intentional infliction of mental suffering, malicious prosecution, libel and slander, and fraud. Intentional torts to property include trespass to the property, trespass to chattel and conversion. The two main categories of type of injuries are injury to the person, injury to property, and then there are subcategories in each of these and in this video, we are going to skip this topic uh, or extensive coverage of this topic because this can be really, really a big topic it's by itself. Depending on the category of tort and the type of injury, damages can be either compensatory or punitive in nature. Usually, compensatory damages are awarded for strict liability and negligence, whereas punitive damages are almost certain to follow an, int an intentional tort. Compensatory damage awards can be expenses such as legal fees, lost wages, and for pain and suffering. Of course, the overall objective of awarding damages for committing tort is to restore the plaintiff to the position he or she would have been in if the tort had not been committed. We can say that there are three distinct categories of damage awards. First, general damages. These are compensation for non-monetary loss or harm suffered as a result of the commission of the tort that was foreseeable when the tort was committed. Example, pain and suffering, mental distress, or damage to reputation. Second, special damages. Here, the intention is to compensate for quantifiable monetary losses suffered by the plaintiff that include direct losses such as amounts the plaintiff had to spend to try to mitigate problems, consequential or economic losses such as lost profits in a business, and third, punitive damages. These are awarded to punish certain types of behavior such as fraud and bad faith and of course intentional thought. In all the cases when the damages are awarded, Plaintiffs have a duty to mitigate their damages. Even in situations where a tort was committed, an injury has happened, and damages can be assessed, there may be valid excuses for the defendant. These situations where the excuses exist are when plaintiff himself herself is negligent, and the plaintiff knows the risk and assumes the risk anyway. In certain cases, one person can be liable for the harm caused by another person. It's called vicarious liability. One example relevant to professional liability is an employer's liability for the actions or omissions of its employees. A lot of insurance companies offer professional liability insurance for professionals. In fact, some contracts actually require you that you have liability insurance before you proceed with work. And there are two types of policies. 
first occurrence policies which cover incidents that take place during the policy term and the second type is claims made policies which cover claims made during the policy term and the scope of indemnification by insurer is described in the policy and it may or may not include legal fees let me editorialize a little bit here anybody who has any type of insurance on anything and then have a legitimate claim to make and they will find out that insurance companies normally will try to find any loophole that will enable them to avoid paying that claim liability insurance or professional liability insurance is no exception what kind of exclusions we are talking about when it comes to professional liability some typical exclusions include errors and omissions outside the insured party's area of professional practice if you are a civil engineer and that's what your area of expertise and you try to do something in mechanical which is not your area of expertise more than likely they will not cover your liability on that also taking an unreasonable risk related to the responsibility that the common law normally imposes on a contract may not be covered let's summarize our coverage on professional liability the first takeaway is that there are three kinds of torts strict liability negligence and intentional tort in two of the three that is negligent tort and strict liability tort damages are usually limited to compensating the victim through an enforceable judgment for monetary damages also damages awarded by a court accomplish only approximate justice for the injuries or property damage caused by a tort feeser of course a tort tort feeser is a person who committed the tort tort laws go a step further toward deterrence beyond compensation to the plaintiff in occasionally awarding punitive damages against the defendant these are almost always in cases where an intentional tort has been committed and that marks the end of part 6 of video series on ethics and professional practice thanks for watching